So to lead us off this afternoon, I would like to invite our provost, David Harris, um, provost and senior vice president, to offer some remarks on the occasion. Um, we'll then hear from Dr. Amy Freeman, um, and then uh, Katrina Moore from the Africana Center will offer remarks before we hear from the Tufts Black Theater Troupe. So thank you all so much for joining us, those who are here and uh, those who are joining us through live stream. Um, we look forward to uh, a very inspiring, challenging, and thought-provoking event this afternoon. Thank you. David Harris. Thanks, Greg. Thanks to you and your colleagues for organizing this wonderful event uh, this afternoon. Um, the fierce urgency of now. So um, as I thought about some welcoming remarks, I committed to not doing one of the horrible things you can do on a program when you're an early speaker, which is to remark on what the keynote speaker is going to say later before he or she gets to do that. So I am going to not comment on that particular quote. But it did make me think about MLK quotes, and it made me think, as I find myself often doing these days, back on a different president, a recent president. And it made me think about President Obama and what was almost certainly his favorite MLK quote. He certainly said it all the time. And that is that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Now, one thing that's clear is that um, time's not linear. So uh, that bending, right, the rate at which it's bending seems to have changed, perhaps. And I think you can also question whether um, it always is bending in one direction, sort of maybe some zigs and some zags along the way. I thought about the fierce urgency of now. I thought about the um, arc of the moral universe bending towards justice. And I thought about Tufts in this event. And really, by way of welcome, just to reflect on really two different components of both of those, I think, represented here today, and part of what I hope we accomplish here this afternoon and early evening. The first component is action, and the second is knowledge. When we think about action, we think about social change, especially in our Tufts community and nearby communities, not just campus, but the place in which we reside as a university. I think about things that we do, and I think about can we better bend that arc towards justice? And I think about, are we really living up to the fierce urgency of now? I think about activities and actions we take. The Chief Diversity Officer, and I'll talk about Amy Freeman in a moment, introduce her. I think about a Bridging Differences Initiative, which is designed to address the fact that we have people here from a range of life experiences, but too often people leave without appreciating where one another are coming from and what we try and do about this. I think about our commitment to meeting 100% of demonstrated need with respect to financial aid and asking the extent to which we are really achieving on that and how can we do better. I think about faculty and staff retention and recruitment. How can we do better and bend that arc and have this fierce urgency of now? But I also think about knowledge, not just action. I think about understanding the now and preparing for the tomorrow. Now, I graduated 30 years ago. No, I didn't graduate. I graduated in 91, but 30 years ago, um, I was a freshman at Northwestern University. And I know for students that I'm the age of some of your parents because I have college kids, so I must be the age of some of your parents. And if you said to me in 1991, what's the probability that 30 years later you will have had a president with a black parent followed by a president who failed to condemn white supremacists and made disparaging remarks about all of Africa and about Haiti as places devoid of worthy immigrants? I would have told you the joint probability of those two things happening in 30 years was zero. Yet here we are. And why would I have told you the joint probability was zero? Other than I was an engineering student at the time and that's how they talk. I would have said that because unlike the students who are coming off of the age of President Obama, I was coming off the age of Jesse Jackson. And the age of Jesse Jackson was one in which in 1984, for those who aren't aware or are old enough to have lived through it, uh, Jesse Jackson ran for president. Jesse Jackson only got 12% of the delegates in the Democratic primary, the convention. And he tried again in 88, and he got 30%. I'm thinking, well, if Jesse Jackson can only get 30% of the delegates in the Democratic, Democratic Party, there's no way we're going to have a president who's black in my lifetime. Yet the knowledge gained uh, through studying these issues helped me understand Obama and helped me respond when President Obama was elected, and many, and I'd say far too many people said, good thing we're done with race being an issue. 
right? Not so much, folks. We can talk about historical precedents. And similarly, it's helped me sleep at night sometimes when things happen now and people say, oh, no, it's broken and never again will we have justice. So, well, you know, we've had some dark days in the past. And at Tufts, I'm looking at folks here who are key to helping us achieve that mission. I think about the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. I think about the program Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora and many others, the knowledge. And, of course, in both cases, in that action of knowledge, I think about Tisch College, which straddles it and accomplishes both. So I'm excited to be with you today, excited that we're engaging these issues, that we're thinking together about the action, we're thinking about the knowledge to both achieve now, achieve more broadly, and achieve in the future. With that, let me introduce our Chief Diversity Officer. So Amy Freeman is our CDO. Uh, she joined us this past September. And people say sometimes, why do we need a CDO? Aren't we all working on these issues? Don't we all care? And as Amy's heard me say many times, yes, but we need somebody who comes to work in the morning, and who leaves at night, and this is what this person thinks about. Because everybody else gets distracted, students, students with classes, me with whatever we're doing and so forth. But we have someone who's point on this for the university. As Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Provost, she provides leadership on the university's diversity inclusion initiatives. It says she's responsible for advising the community, and she works with the schools to identify inclusive, university-wide strategic priorities and initiatives. Before joining us at Tufts, as I said in September, she was Assistant Dean of Engineering Outreach and Inclusion at Penn State University. So please help me welcome Amy Freeman. Thank you so much. Um, my remarks should be brief if everything goes right. Um, I am really, really passionate about this because I've lived through some things, and as, as many of you have. And one of the things that I really very, very much appreciate about Dr. Martin Luther King and the legacy that he leaves us is because his words and his work is timeless. And so the words, the fierce urgency of now, he said that 40, 50 years ago. It's still true. Um, one of the things that I look at, um, you know, as I, as I look over a wide array of different events in my life, I can remember, um, you know, when you look back across multiple generations, it becomes clear that it's an ongoing continuum. It's not, it's not a one and done kind of a thing. And I think that's something that you learn as you live longer and evolve longer. I can remember complaining about something. I was at the university and I called my mother and you know, all a wide array of different things um, had happened, some of them discriminatory, some of them, you know, all the things. Folks were upset and picketing and racism and this and that. And I remember she told me, and I was really upset. I was done. I was ready to come home, and I don't know why. And, you know. and I remember she said, you know what? Um, a whole lot of us worked really hard and paid a whole lot of money so you could go to that white school and sit there and get your education. So I don't know what they're doing or what you're trying to figure out, but you need to sit there. You need to figure it out because you are the person that's going to take it to the next place. And so I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how to fix it, but I know that that you're there is someone else's accomplishment, and you got to finish that so you can go to the next place. And my message to especially the students would be just, you're here because you are our hope for the future. And um, when you think about the fierce urgency of now, there's so many things that are urgent. Um, you know, government politics, I need I say more, um, freedom of speech issues around the world globally. Um, you know, there's so many, many different things, whether it's race, religion, gender identity, um, the regular uh, cast of unfortunate uh, characters that, um, that embody hate and, and bad things. Uh, Martin Luther King spoke to that and the words are still true. One of the things I would encourage you to do is to act where you are. Everybody is not a we shall overcome picket carrying, you know, person. So it doesn't have to be that. Wherever you are, though, act. Some people are better one-on-one. -on -one. Some people are better, I don't say anything, but I follow through doing certain actions to make sure certain things get done. And then there are others for whom I must be vocal, I must, and if that is your gift and that is who you are, do so. Um, but I encourage you, wherever you are, to act and to, um, and to honor the fierce urgency of now. And the fierce urgency of now, not just now at this moment, but all of the now moments through time that have got us to this place. And I think as we go forward, we will wind up at whatever the next place is. And, um, and I believe it'll be a good place. When I look at students, I see the future, and the future looks extremely, extremely bright. 
Um, I'm really proud to have supported this particular event, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers and so on, and leaving inspired. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Katrina Moore, the director of the Africana Center here. And each year, we take the time to come together to honor the legacy of Dr. King. And I'm very excited that this is an important event for the university and that we have the support that we do to make this event possible. Um, we are living in a time where we need to focus even more than before on Dr. King and the work that he was able to accomplish in his lifetime. Um, and it, over the years, as we've planned this event, we have really intentionally moved away from looking at Dr. King as the I have a dream, as the dreamer, because he was so much more complex than that. And today, we are continuing with that as we look at where we are today and how this is the time that we all need to come together to affect change. We can't afford to sit back and think about, um, uh, we can't afford to sit back and wait. We have to move today. And another thing that I'm very excited about is in the planning of this event, we don't forget about the students and the student voice. And so I'm very happy to introduce the Tufts Black Theater Troupe, which is one of the newest and upcoming groups at Tufts um, that are dedicated to bringing students across the campus to celebrate theater, art, and works by black artists. Working with artists on campus and around Boston, they are attempting to foster a space that's conducive to the appreciation of black art in its many contributions and its significance in the world today. Dr. King's words will come live through their presentation, and they are an example to how powerful and dynamic such works can be. The Black Theater Troupe hopes to, that you will enjoy this performance and, to, and they are asking you to let Dr. King's words resonate with you as they are spoken today in their readings. I introduce to you the theater, the Black Theater Troupe. The fierce urgency of now. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wombs of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. It is a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice, the Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arc anti-revolutionaries. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust moors, and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. 
this wait has almost always meant never. We come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and the desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you see vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, now, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, now. now, when you see the vast majority of 20 million Negro brothers smoldering in an airtight cage of poverty in midst of an affluent society, now, now when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. We still have a choice, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there's an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will neither be rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself and this is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within him has reminded him of his birthright freedom and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, he has been caught up by the zeitgeist and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America and the Caribbean, the United States of Negro is moving with a great sense of urgency towards the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes that vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations and he must release them. So let him march. Let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If he does not release this repressed emotions in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat. This is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this is normal and healthy discontent, and it can be channeled into a creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. And now as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking of the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. 
We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for justice and peace throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I hope, the circum I hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or as a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Now let us begin. Let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their arrival as full men and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is yours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, we, might cho we must choose this crucial moment of human history. Amen. Amen. Hi everyone, uh, I'm, I'm Kendra Field, I'm a professor of history here at Tufts um, and at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. And uh, I am, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carrie Greenwich. Dr. Greenwich received her doctorate in American Studies from Boston University, where her specialty included African American history, American political history, and African American literature from the 1850 through the 1910s. Her historical work includes research for the Wiley Blackwell Anthology of African American Literature, the Oxford American, African American Studies Center, and the Boston History and Innovation Collaborative. For nine years, she worked as a historian for the Boston African American National Historical Site here in Boston, through which she published her first book, Boston Abolitionists, in 2006. Her forthcoming book, much anticipated, is a biography of African American activist, Boston activist, William Monroe Trotter, which explores the history of racial thought and African-American political radicalism in New England at the turn of the 20th century. She teaches history and Africana studies here at Tufts and is the co-director of the African-American Freedom Trail Project. 
It has been um, truly a highlight of my time here at Tufts to be able to work with Carrie Greenwich on this project and, um, um, and just um, an absolute pleasure. Um, I think um, I will end with a quote um, from Howard Thurman, um, who was a mentor and professor of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, and who said, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Okay, Carrie. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello. We had a wonderful theater troupe, and we had wonderful speakers. Everyone should be excited. So yay, again, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Kendra, very, very much. Um, <clears throat> um, on April 28, 1965, Vernon Carter, the five-foot-tall pastor of All Saints Lutheran Church in Boston, South End, hung a hand-painted protest sign over his shoulders and began walking back and forth outside the Boston School Committee headquarters at 15 Beacon Street, which is now a restaurant in Boston. <laughs> Two days before, the all-white school committee voted against grievances brought to them by the local NAACP against the deplorable conditions in the Boston public schools. Carter's one-man protest, which lasted over 100 days, and eventually drew support from local activists, parents, and clergy, was part of a larger battle against economic and social injustice wrought by discriminatory and exploitative housing, employment, and economic policy. In their protest, Vernon Carter and his supporters, people like Ruth Batson, Tom Atkins, Jonathan Kozel, went beyond moderate calls for equality. Rather, they demanded justice, specifically in the form of a Massachusetts racial imbalance law that would force the committee to take immediate action against deplorable conditions in its public schools. As Ruth Batson told journalists outside Roxbury's Freedom House, quote, Americans everywhere demand equality, but Negroes of this country want something more. As parents, as human beings, we want justice. Six days before Vernon Carter started his one-man protest outside the Boston School Committee office, Martin Luther King Jr. led marchers from Roxbury to Boston Common, where over 50,000 people protested segregated, unaffordable, and inadequate housing, economic inequality, and the racially imbalanced, criminally inadequate public education perpetrated and perpetuated by these systems. Just like today, when many policymakers and white supremacist apologists attempt to co-opt King's radicalism by tweeting ill-informed, ahistorical pronunciations of his supposed beliefs, journalists in 1965 also tried to dilute King's radical calls for justice by proclaiming equality rather than revolution as his ultimate goal. Dr. King appeals for brotherhood, the Boston Globe headline read even as King toured a dilapidated, windowless, rat-infested, predominantly black school building in Roxbury and spoke candidly one-on-one -on -one with black parents in pursuit of Operation Push, which at the time was a radical school desegregation plan that bussed black children from overcrowded, underfunded public schools in Roxbury to empty seats in nearby suburbs. Then, as now, ill-informed apologists, apologists and conservative supporters of the status quo tried to dilute King's radical demands for justice by continuing to co-opt his very language. But King wouldn't let them. Then, as now, many liberal Bostonians in 1965 of all faiths raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for civil rights initiatives across the Mississippi Delta while remaining, in most cases, oblivious to the educational and economic injustice to which they contributed in their own backyards. But again, King wouldn't let them. He wouldn't let them forget their moral obligation to fight injustice much closer to home. At Temple Israel in the Back Bay, where King spoke after meeting the black parents in Roxbury, he thanked liberal Bostonians for raising over $100,000 for the SCLC and SNCC but he also said that the battle waged by black parents against the school committee was not, quote, a battle of white people against black people, but rather one, quote, between the forces of justice and the forces of injustice. Like the Israelites of old, he concluded, 
We must remove the pharaohs who still have hardened hearts. Sometimes these pharaohs are governors. Sometimes they're mayors of cities. Sometimes they're presidents. Sometimes they occupy great positions on school boards. Dr. King concluded with a very prescient warning for future racial moderates who mistake his nonviolent philosophy for political and economic complacency. Quote, every Negro must prepare for the Passover of the future, he said, but you cannot ask a man to feel affection for those who have brutally oppressed him. Future white supremacist apologists unwilling to heed King's radical notion that corrupt pharaohs must be removed reduced King's 1965 Boston protest to a heartwarming display of racial togetherness and respectable black forgiveness. But the radical nature of true economic and social justice, rather than empty platitudes of legal and social equality, were not lost on King or the many members of the community who hosted him. When school committee leader Louise Day Hicks attempted to co-opt King's Boston protest by agreeing to meet with him for a photo op in the very offices that refused black parents, teachers, and students, he politely refused. Hicks, after all, only agreed to this photo op with King if local black parents, activists, what she called civil rights agitators and liberals were kept out of the picture. Rather presciently, King knew that the sin of American racism, segregation, and economic exploitation would never be eradicated through liberal professions of equality and goodwill. As his close friend and advisor, Ralph Abernathy, often said, quote, a rattlesnake does not commit suicide. You have to smite it out. Vernon Carter, Ruth Batson, Melnia Cass, and other black Bostonians knew this too. And when Massachusetts finally passed its racial imbalance law, ending Carter's boycott in August 1965, they realized that this legislation, the first of its kind to mandate state action to end racially imbalanced and underfunded public schools, they realized that this first of its kind action was not enough. And so they continued to push for radical justice, this time through a 1968 Federal Civil Rights Act that envisioned a radical restructuring of American housing policy. It was in this context, the stalled 1967, at the time, Fair Housing Act, and increasingly virulent impatience with liberal professions of equality without justice, that Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his impassioned statements on the fierce urgency of now. After over a decade of public protests, impassioned civil rights campaigns, and massive arrests in the name of social justice, King told the New York City uh, Company of Clergy and Laity Concerned About Vietnam that tomorrow, the favorite eventuality of moderates, conservatives, and accommodations of all colors had already arrived. Quote, in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, he said, there is such a thing as being too late. And the theater troupe did this very well, so my scraggly voice, I'm sorry, I'm repeating them. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain a flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. In our public memory of Martin Luther King Jr., we often ignore his prophetic warning that misguided moderation and continued accommodation to the forces of injustice lead us to a moment when we are too late. Indeed, the inevitable result of exalting the I have a dream king over the fierce urgency of now, King, is the collective amnesia and dangerous ignorance that has brought us to our current political moment. Although the statement that those who forget history are deemed to repeat it is overused and barely understood, it is no less true. When we reduce Martin Luther King Jr.'s message to his 1963 dream for all of God's children seeing free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we are free at last, when we do that, we forget that our current Racially infused government shutdown is the logical consequence of a collective forgetting that conflates conservative notions of equality with radical demands for racial, social, and economic justice. Thus, for all of us to properly realize Martin Luther King's fierce urgency of now, we must resist the tendency to conflate equality and justice. 
to applaud King's 1965 speech on the Boston Common while forgetting Vernon Carter, Ruth Batson, and Thomas Atkins' battle for public education. As we spend today learning from and listening to our guests, Emery Wright, and I'm sorry, sorry if I get names wrong, Emery Wright, Chris Cato, Cheryl Crawford, and Lydia Edwards, as we listen to all of our guests, I say we must do more. We must appreciate and learn from and exalt the radical notion about a theological, theological arc of justice, even as we recognize the true meaning of King's most misquoted and misunderstood mantra. True, he said, the arc of justice is long and points toward justice. But before quoting this, we must recognize that he was actually taking this from a 19th century Boston abolitionist clergyman named Theodore Parker and that King actually placed it in the context of a different form of justice. King actually warned us that justice is not guaranteed in some liberal future when racism, inequality, and evil suddenly end. Rather, the battle for justice is constant, and the pharaohs that perpetuate injustice must be removed. As we celebrate and commemorate King, then, we must remember the first part of that often decontextualized quote, so that we will always remember that justice is indeed a constant struggle. Evil, he said, and this is the beginning of the quote, may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross, but that, that same Christ will rise up and split history into AD and BC so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. Thank you. <laughs>